Welcome back viewers. This video covers the second part of my bass boat renewal project. If you missed part one, be sure to check out my channel and see the outboard engine rebuild and subscribe if you want to follow new and upcoming videos on this topic. Back in September of 2021, I picked up this old fiberglass bass boat. I bought it off a local Dennis Hopper lookalike for about 1600 bucks in the condition you see here. It was in pretty rough shape, but it was in good enough condition to refurbish. The transom was solid and there wasn't any sign of rot below deck. There were some rough spots in the fiberglass and the top coat paint job was pretty sketchy, but it was a project that I was confident I could turn around in a reasonable amount of time. The original hull data plate was non-existent, so being the resourceful lad that I am, I located some literature to identify the make and model. It's a 1978 Skeeter HP 150, a predecessor to the Wrangler 2 models that were popular in the early 80s. It's a 16 footer with a 7.5 foot beam. It has a built in helm, a large live well in the stern, and a small live well in the bow. The hull plane was originally set up for a two person seating configuration with a casting platform on the bow and the stern. It came equipped with the late 60s Kike for Mercury 652 stroke and an older Minn Kota Edge 12 volt trolling motor. With the 2021 winter season setting in, I first tackled the outboard engine rebuild which I cover in another video. I also started stripping down the hull knowing that I had a lot of carpentry, wiring, and paint preparation work to be done once spring hit. The plumbing below deck and the wiring on this boat were totally suspect, so I gutted all of it and I would replace it at a later date. This stuff was gross and it all went into the trash bin. The top side was painted in a hideous purple maroon color with a very beat up white nylon rub rail that I removed immediately. Most of the top side paint flaked off surprisingly easy with a razor blade scraper and a DA with 80 grit sandpaper. I had to get this down to bare glass so I could make repairs to any areas that showed signs of cracking and provide a solid base for fairing compound. One area in particular on the starboard bow needed a lot of attention. At some point in its life this had hit a dock at ramming speed and uh, stupid amounts of fairing compound were used to cover it up. With winter underway, it was a great time to strip down the seats, which were worth salvaging, and do some reupholstery. I made up my own patterns off the original foam and sewed it up using high quality marine grade vinyl, 4mm scrim foam, and heavy duty UV stable nylon thread. These got attached to the seat bases using stainless staples. The original casting seat hardware was too flimsy for my liking, so I upgraded to some very sturdy pedestal bases that had height adjustments and uh, swivel locks. I was planning to run a power jack plate, so I had to re-drill the transom for the mounting hardware and fit a new reinforcement plate from aluminum. The original plate was a piece of 8th inch steel, which is pretty ridiculous even for fresh water. The transom would need to be stripped down to bare glass and all the previous rigging holes filled in glass. The drain for the motor well was also in rough shape, so I needed to rework this area so it was watertight and properly reinforced with a biaxial fiberglass mat. The trolling motor that came with the boat wasn't in bad shape. It's an older style that uses a push-pull cable control with a foot pedal. It worked fine and it, I only needed to replace the plastic top cover since the, the directional indicator was missing and the cover had a big crack in it. I opted to fit a recessed pedal pan since these are way more comfortable than standing on one foot all the time. To fit this I had to make a cutout in the bow deck and relocate the control switch from the side of the pedal to a small bracket mounted to the pan. Back in the motor well I also drilled and fitted a rigging boot since the boat didn't originally come with one. I pulled up the floor to access and inspect the bilge which appeared to be dry and in good shape. The floor decking however was not. It hadn't been properly sealed and it was secured in place with drywall screws to the stringers so it was pretty much rotted out. I ripped it all out and added it to the scrap pile. This allowed full access below the deck so I could clean, degrease, and apply several coats of high quality epoxy bilge paint. On the helm there was originally a blown out 5 inch speaker and a shore power plug. These got tossed and I added two new shore power plugs to provide easy hookups for my new onboard battery chargers. One is for the house battery bank and the other was for the trolling motor battery bank. The original single speaker was mounted in a really bad location so I opened up the glass around it 
and fitted in a watertight access panel that would house a proper fuse block that was dry and easy to access. The outboard had come with an original style cast aluminum MER control box. Uh, it was a pretty nice unit, uh, pretty retro, but it wasn't mounted properly and honestly it was too far gone to salvage. I found a more modern Quicksilver replacement unit that had unmolested wiring, a kill switch, a built-in rocker switch for power tilt, and also new throttle and shift cables, a much needed upgrade. The gunnel near the helm station was really clapped out. Aside from the Swiss cheese of holes uh, that were drilled into it, it looked like somebody had gone after it with an angle grinder. So I had to roughly locate where I needed to mount the new control before I dug deeper into stripping down the paint and then resurfacing all that panel substrate. While I was in there, I went ahead and located and fit out a new set of marine speakers uh, that wasn't so cheesy and it fit perfectly right inside that space in the gunnels. The hull registration numbers had to go also. The originals looked like they came straight off of my grandma's mailbox, which isn't bad if you're looking for that hardware store chic appearance. The replacements were professional vinyl cut and they were colored to match the final paint scheme. Behind the pilot station there's a compartment where I mounted one of the onboard chargers and a tray for the starting battery. This charger will support the starting battery as well as the two deep cycle house batteries that are mounted further back in the bilge compartments. This was a perfect location for a battery disconnect switch, a much needed safety improvement that allows you to isolate or combine banks of batteries if needed. All connected with appropriately sized marine grade wiring with waterproof crimp connections and a separate fuse block to manage the loads located in the bilge. Two new live well pumps were fitted one for each live well, and they use flow right three-way valves. Two bilge pumps were also added for redundant bailing. One is a manually toggled unit from the helm, and the second is a high flow backup that operates automatically with a built-in float switch. On the port side stern, there was more Swiss cheese to contend with. The original bilge vents had been removed at some point, and they stuffed rod holders in their place. This was not to my liking. So knowing that I needed to do a lot of glass work back here, I fitted out an anchor plate and I cut out a new location for some bilge vents. The anchor unit is a Minn Kota Deckhand 40 power winch. At this point I continued stripping paint and doing some rough carpentry work to update the floor plan. The bow deck would be expanded to take better advantage of the floor space for battery storage and also for a dry locker. This would also increase the usable area of the casting platform. All this woodwork would later come out so it could be fully sealed in glass with penetrating epoxy. At the bow, a lot of work was done to remove a thick layer of fairing compound that was hiding hull damage underneath. This had been plastered over two large cracks that needed proper structural repair. This was built up and reinforced using several layers of biaxial glass mat. A similar treatment was done in the stern motor well to make a strong and watertight basin with functioning drain. Several layers of glass were laminated over the top of the transom also to seal it up. This would eventually be capped off with an aluminum trim piece and an aluminum reinforcement for the jack plate. This boat originally came with dual fuel tanks in the stern that had filler necks accessible from the top side of the boat, and I'm assuming these were probably made out of aluminum. These types of tanks rarely stand the test of time, and they had been removed at some point. I thought about converting these fill caps into bilge vents at, at some point, but then I just decided to paint them and leave them in place. After lots of scraping and sanding, the top side was starting to clean up, and I could continue progress with rough carpentry on the aft casting deck. A lot of old fiberglass boats had some pretty unorthodox hull layouts, and this one was a good example. The floor plan is disjointed, and it's broken up into a series of poorly placed compartments many of which are too oddly shaped to serve a useful function. The rod locker, for example, isn't even long enough to store a fishing pole. So I chose to build up a large continuous platform with expanded storage in what was just open floor space before. With the framing of the bow locker roughed up, you can start to see the makings of a more conventional modern layout that has continuous flat floors forward and aft and a footwell in the midship area. This allows for three across seating when you're underway. 
The jump seats are easily removable if I choose to reconfigure them in the future. On the port side, I framed up what would become an armrest compartment with integral storage, and it doubles as a step to the aft casting deck. I also started piecing together the skeleton of a more functional helm layout. The clunky steering rack was removed and it was replaced with a C-Star planetary gear drive and a tilt wheel. This would house a gauge cluster and it's flanked by panels of marine rocker switches for all the various switched loads that I intend to add. I made up the gauge cluster and switch panels out of 8th inch aluminum plate which was laser cut. All the helm wiring was prefabricated on the bench and I used sealed weather pack waterproof connectors to simplify installation and serviceability. Everything was meticulously labeled for making connections back to the fuse center. The jack plate is a beaut, and I picked it up from Bob's machine. This is plenty powerful for outboards up to the 120 horsepower range, and it adds 6 inches of setback from the transom. This was fitted to get a new attachment hole scheme laid out, and also um, to figure out the routing for all the various rigging. I located an OEM power trim unit for my Merc, which was cleaned, bench tested, and repainted. This attached to the jack plate using some custom made aluminum spacer plates and stainless steel hardware. The rough carpentry for the aft compartments and the armrests started to come together, making sure to leave room for beverage holders. And as I started to lock down the finished pieces, they were all removed for sealing in, in glass with epoxy resin. At the base of the helm, I made up another aluminum trim plate to fit out the controls for the live well valves, uh, their timers, and also a Bluetooth marine stereo receiver. Another important safety feature was attached to the jack plate. This twist step ladder allows for easy ingress back into the boat from the water. More glass work was done at the perimeter of the transom to close up the gaps and to bond the top side shell to the hull. With all the old attachment holes filled and glassed, the entire transom was sanded and fared, and then gel coated black to match the bottom hull. All the through hole fittings were secured with thickened epoxy or with high quality 3M 5200 marine sealant. The pickups for the live well pumps were installed. These attached to the pumps using these convenient quick connect fittings, so you don't need to hang upside down and screw around with tightening worm gear clamps. The valves are remotely controlled at the helm to fill, recirculate, or empty out the live wells. The bilge and through hole fittings all use similar hose in these uh, quick connectors. Up under the mid deck, I also ran drain tubing for uh, recessed cockpit drains that empty into the aft bilge. In the stern compartments, the dual fuel tanks were fitted with tie downs, each having a replaceable inline filter that goes to a selector valve and then out to a quick connector in the motor well. The interior of the live wells was pretty disgusting. I ended up removing a baffle in the aft well that had been poorly secured with about two full tubes of silicone. This baffle is actually really necessary um, to minimize slosh in the tanks side to side. So a new one was made out of 3 16 Luan that was glassed and then fully encased in resin. This was finished uh, and then tabbed into place permanently with fiberglass strips and thickened epoxy. And then the whole compartment was sanded and gel coated in white. At the bow, the small live well had some signs of cracking in the corners, which was also repaired and reglassed, and a similar baffle installed, and it was gel coated as well. Miscellaneous decking pieces were removed, uh, sealed, and glassed, and then uh, some got prepped for carpeting. All the wooden components were completely and thoroughly sealed with penetrating epoxy to minimize water intrusion and the potential for rot. The underside of the hatch lids were painted at this point um, before they were carpeted uh, for a clean look. Uh, the carpeting itself was fairly easy to do, but it's pretty time consuming. Uh, it's just glued down and uh, secured with some stainless staples. And then the latch hardware uh, finished off the hatch lids. Now I don't have pictures, but trust me, there is a lot of wiring that was done under the deck uh, that was strung out from the fuse center to each of the loads. And I also uh, laid out some LED courtesy lights on the deck. These are really cool because they have a very low power consumption and they can be configured for a whole bunch of different colors. 
The carpeting continued on all the modular parts, hatch lids, bulkheads, and the armrest. And then all of these eventually received stainless steel piano hinges. The armrest turned out really nice. I was pleased. It was carpeted throughout and I added a power port. Um, so if you wanted to store your phone in there, you could charge it. Um, the hatch har hardware is uh, T-lock handles that are lockable from TH Marine. And these are really, really nice units. Um, in all, I was really pleased with how this deck layout uh, ended up. And it was really clean and smooth once it got all carpeted with uh, special attention to all the gaps. I added a bracket to fit a bait pail in the aft live well. And in the bow deck, I built a small anchor locker that had a built-in drain uh, down to the bilge. At this point, I was uh, pretty satisfied with the helm layout. So that was finished up by a, a coat of uh, fiberglass, uh, some resin, and then a coat of what's called Rondo. Um, so that's a mixture of resin and fairing compound or, you know, body filler like Bondo. Um, that provides a really thick but smooth surface uh, that does a great job of filling and blending. Uh, and it sands out way better than just resin alone. Uh, once I was satisfied um, with all that surfacing work, the helm was permanently attached using stainless screws. And then it was uh, filleted with thickened epoxy and then tabbed into place uh, with the existing helm using some fiberglass strips. At this point, it was the end of summer. Um, fall is a pretty hectic time of the year for me, and I had some mission-critical tasks that I needed to get done before winter. So this was as far as I got on this project uh, this year. As much as I wanted to complete this project, uh, it just wasn't in the cards. Uh, so I covered the boat up, hauled it over to storage for the winter, and I set myself up pretty good for the spring, uh, when basically I just need to pull it out, dewinterize it, and then do some final topside sanding and, and, uh, and gel coat work. And then, maybe just then, I'll be able to join the prestigious fraternity of elite anglers. When that time comes, I'll be sure to do a follow-up video. Uh, and in the meantime, I, I'll plan on doing a separate video dedicated just to the wiring, uh, because that's a, that's a whole subject uh, by itself. I hope you enjoyed this, and if you want to see more videos like this, please subscribe to my channel for updates and, uh, and all other kinds of great content. Until next time, thanks for watching.